Hello, everyone. It's great to see you guys. Um, so, yeah, well, that's weird. Here's for being really old. Yay. So, no, it's, thank you, guys. Um, I was going to say something. Uh, at my age, I can't remember. Um, no, I was going to ask before I was interrupted. Uh, how many of you guys like road trips? Okay, how many like road trips with your kids? <laughs> like three people. Your kids are out of the house, Darcy. You're like, oh, it's so wonderful. Your kids are in their 20s and they take care of themselves and they drive half the time and you sleep in the back. Yeah, that's true. No, it's great. It's, it, isn't it interesting how different it is when the road trip and road trip with kids um, I don't know, do you have a, like a travel snack food, something that you'd like to eat when you're, when you're in the car? I'm going to ask, and I'm going to count to three, and then I want to hear from you. Just yell it out, okay, on three. One, two, three. Jerky. I heard Funyuns, jerky, like someone's mad about jerky over here. Funyuns, in the last service, it was like the husband said fun, uh, jerky, and the wife said cinnamon bears. I'm like... That is disgusting. Like in the car, that'll keep you awake to Winnemucca. That's how bad that smells. That's horrible. The first service, someone goes, beer. And I'm like, that's illegal. You know, like what is wrong with people? I mean, it's 8.15. And so I'm like, we're begging you to come to this service. I'm like, beer for everyone, you know? And so we didn't do that though, because we're in a school and we can't. We don't want to go to jail or get kicked out. So but no, I mean, you've got these snacks, you've got a road trip. Uh, a year ago, our family got a, uh, Rock Harbor gave us a sabbatical, and so we went for six weeks and got a chance to uh, rent a minivan in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then drive 6,000 miles, you know, while you're trying to rest and restore with the Lord. And so um, we hopped in this minivan, and we, that, was, that was after, that was at the end of the trip, and I just want to give photo credit to the stranger that walked by in the parking garage when we turned the van. Um, it needed an oil change like 3,000 miles ago. But anyways, <laughs> dropped that baby off. And, um, but we put all those people and all that stuff in the back of it. We had it down to a science every place we went to the next thing. This suitcase went here and here and here. And I just remember the kids going through um, the plan on who was sitting where. And there was just this strategy around it. I mean, when you rent the largest ca car that they actually rent at Dollar Rent-A-Car, and you need every seat, it's important where you're sitting, okay? And our kids, I don't know if anybody else's kids has done this, but they set a timer, and you're in seats for a certain amount of time. Like on an iPod, like, go, okay, at two hours we switch, you know, kind of thing. Does anybody else's kids do that? No. One. And Darcy's like, I don't know, I'm sleeping in the back the whole time. <laughs> so I have no idea what they do. Um, drinking a beer. Um, <laughs> No, for real though, they, they have this timer and they move around the car and this was the plan. Well, here's what they did this time. They made apartments. They made their own complex. And so we had the, the green compartment, the, the blue, the tan, and then we had the red and they made their own quarters. I remember growing up as a kid, we had the bench seat in the back of the car and the bench seat in the front. And when my parents turned the corner, you go sliding across it, you know, and you come back and then you yell at your sister like, this is the line, that little niche in the fabric. You can't get past the peanut butter and jelly that's right here, you know, you can't go past that. And I remember arguing and, you know, today it's just different. Like kids are in car seats until they drive. Like, I think you get out of car seat when you're 14, you start driving like the next year. And that's how it feels like. But we're in this, this car and they put a plan together in the middle. It's like one of those long houses that they sell now, like the long skinny house. Yemi's like living it up and in her pretty much two bedroom. Um, but they're trying to find a way to get along. And, and I'm thinking about this whole one in spirit family vacation. You maybe been on the vacations that aren't quite, you know, awesome. Uh, you have these plans and you're excited, but staying in unity can be hard and everybody has different goals for the experience trip or whatever. And you're, maybe the car broke down or something changed or you get, you're coming home and you're rested and then you get, the plane doesn't take off and you have, get stuck in some airport for two days and things change. So the desire 
for us and the desire for Paul in this passage is to stay in unity. How do we stay in unity with one another? How do we stay in unity with the church? How do we stay in unity with the relationships that we have around us? And, and so our series, One in Spirit, has been something we're, we're looking at some pretty difficult passages that Paul's addressing a church in Corinth about. And he's saying, hey, you really need to put aside what your desires for the desires of other people. That even though it may be lawful for you, it doesn't mean that it's permissible and that we should do it. And so he's saying, okay, what do we set aside in order for the gospel to go forth? Uh, when you came in, you got a program, and on the program, there's some notes. Uh, there's also a section that has some weekly reading that will press us into this week so that we can learn more so what happens. This doesn't happen during this short period of time here. Um, and uh, for those that are online just during this, this podcast or this, uh, this message video, we want it to carry into who we're becoming, what scripture looks like that, that cross-references this with, with this, and then also hiding God's word in our hearts. We have some scripture memory that's Galatians 5.1 that couples perfectly with our summer circles because uh, we want to be in unity with that. So I encourage you to take some, some steps of further growth past our time that we have here. But no, Paul is saying there's one goal here. The one goal that he lives for very clearly, is I want to see people who don't have a relationship with Jesus to come into a relationship with Jesus. I want to see lost people found, and I want to see found people follow. I want to see lost people found. I want to see the found people follow. So once you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to see them, the church be equipped for the work of the ministry so that then they are going and they are finding people and working diligently to see the kingdom of God continue to be multiplied. And so this is his one goal, and he is committed so strongly to this goal that he says, hey, I'm willing to set aside my own desires to not get in the way of the gospel. Are we willing to set aside our desires to not get in the way of the gospel? Big question for today. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. The second I hear this build up word, we even looked just a couple of chapters back. On Father's Day, we talked about building up, and I had a block up here on this table and said, Hey, are we building up and edifying as leaders, building blocks, a foundation firmly built on Christ, or are we a balloon hovering over, blown up with arrogance and knowledge, looking down and judging, or are we building up the good things that are founded in Scripture? He's saying, Let us build up good things. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So just because it's lawful doesn't mean that it's, it should be done. And we need to ask ourselves the question when it, we're given an opportunity. The Bible speaks of different things, and sometimes people would say, I wish the Bible would make it more clear about the gray areas of should we do this, should we not do this. We need to ask ourselves the question, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Is it helpful to per participate in this thing or, or to do these things? We have to always ask, is this helpful? How does this reflect upon the gospel? Because the liberties that we've been given, these liberties, that they may be lawful. The liberties we've been given, they come with a responsibility. So the liberty that we have in this nation, the liberty that we have in our community, the liberty, liberty that we have as followers of Jesus, it comes with a responsibility that we've been given this great gift of salvation. It's now ours to share. So what do we do with liberty and be responsible with it. Because we're supposed to enjoy the liberties that we've been given. I mean, the, the Christian walk, uh, the liberty um, around whether it, can, whether it be alcohol, whether it be, you know, different things that we could look at. There are things that are for our enjoyment, but we also have to say, okay, what does this liberty look like in the light of my non-believing friends? Those people who have yet to, to find Jesus Christ, yet to give their life uh, to Jesus Christ. What does that look like? And so I have some decisions to be made in this, but I wouldn't want my liberty to stand in the way of someone better understanding Jesus. So we have to also look and go, hey, what's my heart behind this liberty? What's my motive behind participating in whatever that liberty would possibly be? And we have to be honest about that and say, do I have a crutch here? Am I just desiring it because of my own flesh? Or is this a liberty that I can rightfully before God say, hey, I'm not going to let this liberty trump the love of Christ being shown through me. Don't let our liberty trump the love of Jesus Christ. The liberty we have in Christ should be less than the love that we have for Christ. This verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. 
I want to come back to that minivan, okay? I want to come back to the minivan because we just got back from family vacation. Once again, largest vehicle we rented from Dollar Rent-A-Car. We got people in their seats. We got seven of us jammed in there. You know, no leather, no, no, no DVD players, no nothing, just us and country music, okay? And so we're, I mean, Christian music. Um, and we're, we're driving down um, the road and the kids start to talk about who's supposed to be in what seat. And as parents, you're just like, mm. you're thinking, we're on vacation. Do you know how much this is costing us to be here? You know, kind of a thing. And so they're talking, and they're talking to bicker, maybe. I mean, how many of you kids, is, you're don't, they don't bicker? No one likes you, okay? Um, but they started to kind of start to bicker about it. And so my wife dropped this line on them that was so good, it made the program. It's your first blank, okay? Um, she dropped it. I grabbed my phone. I start speaking into my phone exactly what she said. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. I did ask her permission. Now, I didn't put the part where she said, and you're lucky to be alive, because that just, you know, is a little awkward. <laughs> you're lucky to be in the blank. A child of God. No, alive is what it would have been. So, but here's what she said. She said, life is not fair. It's about serving and sacrificing for others. Give something up and do something for someone else. Amen, sister. That was Christiana Harrington, Family Vacation 2018. Life is not fair. It's about serving and sacrificing for others. Give something up and do something for someone else. And I was like, amen. And all the moms said, amen, right? All the dads said, amen, because it's about setting aside. But it's not just the childish thing. It's not like, hey, come on, kids, quit fighting over seats. And hey, you know, share with one another. This is an adult thing too, okay? This is no matter who we are, what age we are, to set aside the desires we have in our flesh to say, I'm choosing the things of the Spirit. To starve ourselves of something that would give us that temporary satisfaction in order to feed the Spirit, to feed, to provide, to do something for someone else. Are you willing to give up your personal rights? What a question. Are you willing to give up a liberty? Are you willing to give up a right where you deserve or you're entitled to? Or you surely should by this age or, or if, if, if God you know, has provided and God has done this, then you should have the choice to be able to bless yourself. Are you and I, are we willing to give up our personal rights for someone else? Are we willing to sacrifice maybe an immediate gain, something that we would get a quick blessing, personal blessing from for an eternal reward? To say, hey, I'm giving up the now for the eternal, for the later. I'm willing to sacrifice what would feed my flesh right now, maybe an, an immediate pleasure for an eternal joy. See, here's the thing with Paul. As he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth, Paul used to not be a follower of Jesus. There was a time where he killed Christians. Well, then he had a radical encounter with God. He was on his way to a crusade. He's on his way to pursue taking the lives of those who are part of this Jesus following of the way. And he was struck down by a light from the sky. And he heard a voice from God. He had an encounter with Jesus at that moment. And scales came over his eyes and he was blinded. But these scales were not just a physical scale. The scale that was over his, his spiritual life. And it was broken open. And he surrendered to that voice. And he surrendered to the authority of God in his life. He became a follower of Jesus. Paul was baptized. He took those next steps. And now he's walking into these gathering of church people. They're having these house churches. And he's like, hey. And they're like, Paul's coming. And some people are like, I'm not coming tonight. What if Paul's going undercover? What if Paul's trying to find us? And then he's going to tear us out to one of his crusades. There was a lot of skepticism going around. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. I'm living for the eternal now. And now he's using these words, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Chapter 11, verse 1. A lot of theologians would look at this and, and they would say, is that supposed to be in chapter 10? Why is it in chapter 11? Because if you've read ahead a little bit, chapter 11 talks about head coverings. It talks about authority and talks about some different things. It's going to be a little bit dicey next week. And in fact, I have four pages of notes that that was going to be the end of today's service. 
well, I've been on vacation, so I guess I had a lot to say. But we didn't quite get there, or that first service we'd be getting out about now. Um, so we decided not to, to go there. I'm like, hey, let's just kind of close here. And God did a really good work because there's something we need to do in our life when we think about, am I living a life worthy of imitating? So when we see this verse living in the first part of 11, it could be chapter 10, verse 34, but it's chapter 11, verse 1. It's actually a great passage to live between two incredible principles, deep things about what should we do and what is lawful and how should I live, and then what does authority and order look like in my life? What does it look like to receive communion? Because if we're to receive communion, our hearts need to be in the right place with God. So next week we're receiving communion, and I believe that it's going to be very powerful. And if we prepare our hearts and we study more than just come and hear or click the play button, whether you're watching online or you're listening, and say, hey, I want to... I want to really understand on my own what this scripture says. I believe we're in for a great weekend next weekend. You know, the verses that, and chapters that exist in the Bible, they haven't always been there. When Paul wrote this letter, he wasn't like, you know, okay, verse number two. He didn't write verses down. He wrote a letter. That letter then was taken, and about a thousand years ago, chapters were put in so people like you and I could figure out where it was actually in the Bible. Back in the day, they memorized the Bible because not everybody had a copy of the Bible. So it was quite different than now. Now we have copies readily available for all of us. Plus, it helps our YouVersion Bible app so we can clip chapter and verse, right? 500 years ago is when they add the verses. And maybe at the title, at the top of your Bible, it says something like, the death of Isaac, Jacob's 12 sons, the family of Esau. That's Genesis like 35 and 36. Those were written by whomever put together this study Bible. Those weren't Paul going, oh, Jacob's 12 sons. He wasn't saying those things, okay? These were just, there wasn't the author of of that portion of Scripture. It was, in fact, put in later. And so these are things added so that we can reference and we can navigate Scripture. So whether it's in the first part of 11 or the last part of 10, it doesn't actually matter. It works well for both portion. But something important for us to know about God's Word, it is fully inspired by God. That's why when we read 2 Timothy and it says, all scriptures breathed out by God. This is from the very breath of God. It's profitable in our life for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God, so that those of us that are following Jesus Christ and we're chewing up his word, that we would be complete, we would be equipped for his good work. Today, that good work, that scripture is talking about, are you a good neighbor? It's saying, are you willing to set aside your own good for the good of a neighbor, for the good of a friend? Are we willing to do that? See, Paul's saying, be an imitator of me as I imitate Christ. Because we can look at that and say, isn't that arrogant to say? Like, hey, dude, follow me as I follow Jesus. Jesus, the beach is not just this way. Jesus is this way. Get behind me. It's, It's not that kind of thing. It's not him saying, I've got it together. It's him saying, imitate me to the degree that I'm imitating Christ. And if you know the ways of Christ, I'm not walking with Christ. You should identify them. And because we're brothers and sisters, you should tell me, you should warn me, you should direct me. And I can reach back and I can encourage and direct. And we are to do that one in spirit in unity with one another. That's what it means. Follow me as I follow Christ. See, at this point when Paul wrote this letter, Jesus had died been buried, and rose again 22 years prior. So to say following Jesus, he had been ascended into heaven. He's in, he's in heaven. There's a following in Jesus. It's following the teachings of Jesus, and the teachings and traditions of Jesus were learned by spending that time with him. And Paul, there's no biblical account that Paul and Jesus had a conversation. Obviously, when the light came down from heaven... There was a conversation that was had. There was a surrender. There was an encounter that took place. But there wasn't one like that we know of. I would guess that Paul and Jesus were around each other. Jesus was in the same area that Paul was studying. And then I would also say as he began his public ministry, people were following and listening to Jesus because they were immediately after his followers to kill, to crucify, to destroy this message of the gospel. So he was probably around him. And so what he's saying in this is as I follow him, because I knew I'm a firsthand eyewitness of him, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm, I'm, the word of God is being communicated through me. I'm writing letters. I'm edifying. I'm planting churches. Follow me in this. Because we look at Paul and we think, man, I'm not him. I am definitely not him. I'm not at that level. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. We can set the goal, obviously, to be like Jesus. But I would say this, some of the greatest influences of my life, I saw the real stink inside of them. They were brothers and sisters that walked this life with me. I'll never forget two of my mentors. I was a sevy. I was a seventh grader, and these two young high school students came into my life and began to radically change me for Jesus Christ. They took time to spend time with an annoying seventh grader. Their names were Matt and Kurt. Kurt's in the yellow sweats, and Matt's in the white T-shirt. I have no idea who the dude is in the middle. I just know he has white high tops and some pretty sweet glasses on, okay? But Kurt was an athlete. Matt was an athlete. They played on the high school football team. They were on varsity. They were weightlifters. I mean, this was before, um, like, steroids really happened and stuff. And Kurt was bench pressing, like, 350, and Matt was squatting, like, 650. And I just remember going, I'm going to be them someday. It hasn't really happened for me. Um, (laughs) But they spent time pouring their life into me, and it started at a young age. I I met them when I was younger. We went to church together. We grew up in that. But when I got into the youth group, they really took me under their wing, and they started to pour their life into me. And I'll never forget, Matt would give me rides in his Mustang and take me places, and he had a cassette tape player that we'd play, like, Christian music um, and maybe some other stuff in. Um, But you had to, like, kind of rig some things to get it to act like actually work you know um kurt drove a vw bug um not like the beetle um but like the original that had been wrecked about 14 times and when when it it started 48 percent of the time i'd say and and when it wouldn't start i would push it and then he would pop the clutch and it would go i think kurt used me honestly um i was a starter (laughs) i think that but they gave me rides everywhere i needed rides I did, I'm seventh grade, you know, I'm like, I got to go places, you know, youth group would get over and we would go to Taco Tico because we didn't have a Taco Bell, but we would go to Taco Tico, we'd spend time and they'd make me buy their dinner and those kind of things. But I was buying friends and I was happy. I mean, I have a picture of myself. Like, look at this, look at this. I'm the dude in the middle, I, underneath the hair. Um, I'm not the guy in the middle. You got Matt, me and Kurt, and then a couple other guys um, from our youth group. We had a picture of me with my shirt off, but we didn't want to cause people to stumble. Um, But I had a lot of hair on my head and like zero in my armpit that day. Um, But they spent time with me. That was at that was at camp, and I'll never forget. I mean, I was a sevy. I was difficult to be around. A sevy, yeah, not a sixlet. I was a sevy. Okay. And they spent time with me. They took they took me places. I mean, I was unlovable, but they loved me, and. I remember them giving me rides, but it wasn't just that. I remember Matt taking a year of his life out to disciple me, and he walked me through a Bible study, and we met every couple of weeks, and they were playing on the varsity football team for Garden City High School, the Raging Buffaloes. We were the stampede, Um, and I remember, you know, I always looked up to them, but I also remember they spent this time in Scripture, in the Word, They spent time pouring into me as a man of, young man, very young man, with a high-pitched voice of God. I remember them telling me, you know, Keith, because I love sports, basketball, football, baseball, tennis, all that. And they were like, hey, man, you're going to be awesome. You're going to carry the torch when we're gone. And they're going to state, and they're doing all this stuff. And Kurt's running touchdowns, and Matt was number 71. I remember every bit of it like it was yesterday. Why am I talking about that today? 29 years later, I'm talking about it. They changed my life. They took time. They gave up something for someone. You know what those guys did? They would swing down Harding from my house, and they would go down to Parkwood, and we would pick up Brett. Then we'd come back around over to Ridgeline, and we would pick up uh, Chris. Sometimes we go up north and pick up Adam by Kenneth Henderson. Then once in a while, we would come over and pick up Jason. Then Brian lived out of town in the country, and we didn't pick him up. But um, (laughs) they would go pick up my friends and fill their car with my friends. 
They could have been filling their car with people just like them. People from their teams, people from their crew, doing things that people their age did. But they came to my house, they picked up my friends, they gave us rides home, and maybe, yes, I had to buy their Coke. <laughs> I remember when Kurt did discipleship with me for a year, and uh, I would buy the McDonald's, you know, the large Coke for, like, back then it was like 12 cents. Um, but we'd go there and we'd spend an hour together and I was just like hoping I'd see my friends. I'd hope they'd see me with Kurt. I remember going to the high school games and they didn't play basketball, either of them, because they were all like this tall and this wide. Um, but I'd go to the games and I'd be like, hey guys. My friends were like, yeah, who's that? And I'm like, I couldn't wait to tell them who it was. If you're a high school or a middle school student in here and you think you have to wait in your life to begin to impact people. Do not wait. I say this passionately because I lived the example of this. I say it passionately because guess what? When I was a senior, there was this sixth grader that was asking for rides for not just him, but him and his friends. And I drove an 82 Camaro. I mean, I looked almost as good as my car. And as I drove that Camaro that fit five people total, I took one of the seats. That means we had four. And the one in the middle really wasn't a seat. It was that bump right over the, the, what is that thing that goes down the middle of a car? I'm blank right now. Drive shaft. God bless you. Um, but the drive shaft that I don't think it was totally legal, but because they were sixlets, you could put them, like six of them, in the back of that little hatch thing, and you could just put them in there. And I would go pick up kids. That kid, Lance, was always asking for rides for his friends. I'm like, oh my gosh. That kid, Lance, is my brother. And that kid, Lance, he loved people. He was an evangelist. And I was an Uber driver. And together we saw a revival take place in that high school that was begun with Kurt and Matt, and we had seven kids in our youth group. Seven. This was camp. We probably had 12 there. And we watched God continue to do a great work. And if you're in middle school and high school and you're waiting, please do not wait another day. You need to start right now. And if you're not in middle school and high school and you're waiting, please do not wait another day. You need to start right now. Because 29 years from now, someone might be talking about that experience they had in our kids' class. Someone 29 years from now might be telling a story about a couple of guys that gave them rides, that cared about them. See, discipleship is about giving what you have to someone else. I learned 2 Timothy 2.2 from these guys because we literally read that verse every single week. that we would train up faithful men to go and do likewise. To heed the scripture. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And these two young guys, they were not perfect. But I did my very best to follow them to the degree, degree that they were imitating Jesus Christ. Who are you leading and how are you leading? See, scripture gives us a lot of direction it maybe doesn't answer to the nth degree, should I participate in this, should I not do this? But it gives us some really clear direction about discipleship. And when we look through that lens, it changes everything. Is there something in your life that you're currently doing that if your kids began to do at a higher level 20 years from now, you would change doing those things right now? I've heard for a long time this statement that what we do in moderation, our children may do in excess. What is that thing in your life that if your kids begin to do more and more and more and more, you would say, I'm going to change the way I'm living right now. So the more and more and more and more that they're doing, the exponential life that they're living is one that is imitating Jesus Christ. See, we hear a statement like that and we feel the shame just pile on us. Did anybody else, am I the only one that felt some shame just now? You think about the thing you said on family vacation that you wished you wouldn't have said. You hope they remember the good experience, but not what you said. 
This isn't meant to feel shame. You know what this is meant for? This is meant for us to press towards the hope that we have, what, what lies ahead of us. See, some of the greatest problems we have in this life is us getting distracted. We get distracted by minor things that create major problems. Major distractions create major problems. I have an officer friend that I texted and asked him, what would it be? Let's say that someone was driving distracted. What would be the citation? He texts me back and says, did you get pulled over again? Robert, Corporal Robert, celebrating his retirement today, 28 years serving Boise PD right here. You're awesome. (laughs) I know how much you love attention. I know you loathe it. But he wanted to know if I got pulled over again, so I wanted to expose him. Um, And he said, you know, it would be inattentive driving, kind of covers a lot of things. Well, I think in our lives, many of us, we live inattentive living. We get distracted by a lot of other things. And Paul is saying, have a narrow focus, have a narrow goal, press forward to this one thing, to see souls saved from the pits of hell, and then once saved on mission, pressing towards the eternity of heaven. He's saying there's one goal. My question is, are we living in the way of the gospel? Are we living the way of the gospel? There's only one word difference in these two statements. Are we living in the way of the gospel? Meaning, hey, I have my liberties. I'm just standing here. The gospel might be hard to see. Now, I'll I'll tell you this. If you're in the way of the gospel, nothing stops the gospel. You will be plowed through. We can't keep the gospel out of people's lives. The gospel is stronger than any one of us or any all of us. But are we living in the way of the gospel? Are we living the way of the gospel? Kurt, Matt, others saying, hey, Jesus is this way. Let me shine the light towards what it means. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's walk towards the gospel. Let's walk towards eternity. Let's run. Let's chase after the things that actually matter in this life. See, we can feel guilt of our past or we can cling to Acts 3 that tells us, repent. If there's been something we've fallen short on, simply repent it because guess what happens? Then we turn our back from it. We just don't say sorry. We say, I want to apologize and I'm going to show that I mean business by turning away from the sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, our sin is blotted out. And guess what comes? A time of refreshing may come to our life. Some of us, we're longing for this time of refreshing. We need some refreshment that comes from who? Christ who's been appointed for us, which is Jesus. There's a time of refreshing that's promised to us. If we'll repent, we'll turn from, we'll blot out, the sin will be blotted out by the grace and the blood of Jesus. He's there to rescue us. He gives us a calling. He's been appointed for us and we've been appointed for him. We're to imitate him. We're to chase after him. And one of the greatest joys I have in being a pastor is getting the opportunity to firsthand watch people radically be changed for Jesus and then watching them sow into the lives of people around them, their children. There's a young man by the name of Matt, and I met him when he was 17 years old. And I had not seen him outside of, I saw him in St. Luke's once, and I remember seeing him in Home Depot one time until about a year and a half ago. And then Matt walked into Rock Harbor Church with an entire family, and I'm like, you have children, you're married. I didn't think you were marriable. I mean, it was all this whole conversation. And we have this, we start talking. Next thing you know, they're getting baptized in a river. And you know what I watched that day? And the conversation I had leading up to that, Matt saying, I want to follow Jesus. And I have not been worthy of imitating at times. But this I know, I've been saved from my sin. And I want to be baptized. And I want my kids to be part of it. And his wife says, I want to be baptized. And he said, okay, I'll baptize you. So I baptized Matt and I baptized his wife and then they baptized their children. I watched an entire destination change. I look at it and I think only God can do that. And I remember looking at him that day. And you may think I was looking into his soul and I was talking about just the moment we were having. I was mesmerized by his beard. Look at that bad boy. I remember bringing him out of the water. It was like I baptized Davy Jones. It was like, whoosh. It was glistening and off. And I was like, 
yes, Lord. You know, I just think of Jesus's beard and that. Anyways, let's go to the next one. Some of us are stumbling right now. But I remember this day, and I remember the days that led up to this from 17 years prior, him as a high school kid, and to see where God is at and see the redemption and the grace and the restoration that happens. To say, I don't want to live in the way of the gospel. I'm going to live the way of the gospel. I want one goal. I want to see souls saved from the pits of hell. And I want to see followers of Jesus committed and on mission for eternity. So are we imitating Jesus Christ? Because believe it or not, there are people that are imitating us. Let's pray together. God, you're so good. You've given us this example of how Paul's lived, but most importantly, you've given us your only son to follow, to be saved by. It's by your grace alone that we can even rejoice, that we can talk of the things of eternity without torment. It's the hope that you bring us. It's the forgiveness you bring us. It's the life that comes only through you. We praise your name for the work you've done today, for hearts that are being drawn, hearts that are being changed, for lives that are being set free. We claim that freedom today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.